mainly I'm growing seed crops. Okay. Um, but also flowers mm -hmm. for bouquets and um, medicinal herbs as well. Okay. Um, so what, most of what you'll see in here is for seed, but for example, all the dahlias are for right. cut flowers and got lots of Tulsi and that whole garden where you parked um, is medicinal herbs. Oh. oh yeah, so I was telling you about what brought me to seed. Right. Food. So yeah, William Moyes Weaver is my was my mentor for the last four years. Okay. And um, you know he's written many books on seed, heirloom seeds, on food ways, particularly Pennsylvania Dutch food ways. Okay. That's his background. Right. Um, and I spent time kind of helping him organize his collection. Yeah. Continue to do what he'd been doing for 40 years. Right. And oh, that's great. And. Um, helping him scale up so that he could sell some of the seeds as yeah. a way to bring in income and support for the project. Um, meanwhile, I met um, some awesome farmers on the eastern shore of Maryland, actually, okay. who wanted to start um, a collective of farmers mm -hmm. up and down the east coast mm -hmm. focused on seeds. Nice. And um, the main instigator is Blaine Snipstall, okay. who is um, of Black Dirt Farms. Okay. And uh, he had been to the White Earth Reservation in Minnesota mm -hmm. um, to an indigenous farming conference and um, had kind of heard the call from some of the indigenous seed keepers to go back to, you know, his own community and start his own seed keepers network. Mm, yeah. And to him, I mean, this is where I heard the term seed keeping first, okay. which is my now my like online profile. Right. <laughs> but um, he you know, the, the seed keepers, indigenous seed keepers, include not just the act of saving the seeds in their work, but the act of saving the culture. Right. The traditions and the mm -hmm. rituals and the stories and the recipes along with that yeah. genetic material. Um, so it's much deeper right. than kind of just propagating plants. Right. It's about kind of propagating culture. And yeah. Preserving culture. Can you talk about that or how that has kind of, how that affects your work or how you incorporate that into your own work? Sure. I mean, to me, that makes it much deeper and much more powerful yeah. to be reconnecting with my own food culture yeah. um, ancestrally, but also working with so many groups around the country who are doing the same thing yeah. and sharing back what I've learned at the Roughwood Seed Collection um, and beyond around seed keeping um, and helping folks who are already preserving their culture through food take it to the next level with seed. Yeah. yeah, preserving seeds right. as well. Right. Um, so and I'm, it takes it from kind of to the next level of actually preserving and conserving, right? Not just the knowledge, but then actually figuring out how to sort of save that in a way. Yeah, exactly. And pass it on. Exactly. And so how that's kind of shaped my project um, is that I've identified, you know, for the last 10, 15 years, I've worked with urban and some rural food sovereignty okay. projects. And where have you done that? Um, I started in San Francisco okay. briefly while I was in school and um, working with some groups in the Bay Area. And uh, when I moved to New York City after that, I worked in food justice organizations, mm -hmm. um, specifically Just Food. It was right, yeah, food. I know Just Food. Yeah, yeah. So I worked there for seven years, okay. if you include my chicken internship. Nice. <laughs> I started it all. Um, and so in that work, I've been able to meet people really all over the world yeah. doing similar work, making yeah. sure that people are able to kind of control their bread basket, right. so to speak, um, so that they're kind of in control of their destiny. That's what one of my other mentors, Abu Talib, uh -huh. um, says, you know, he who controls your bread basket controls your destiny. Yes. So thinking about how communities are able to make their own decisions and grow their own food mm -hmm. and now save the seeds for that food so they don't have right. to rely on other people for that. Right. Um, and so within those networks I've been able to talk to friends and colleagues and people who I really look up to and say, hey, I'm starting a seed catalog. Right. Are you interested in providing some varieties right. um, that are important to your community um, in the catalog as a way to bring in money, yeah. but also as a way to tell your story um, in a very tangible way, right? You know, through sharing the seeds, right? Um, that you grew. So that's how it's kind of. I forgot what your original question was, but that's kind of how it's manifested in my work now, right? Around the importance of keep, keeping the culture, 
Right. I think it's important for people to tell their own stories. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, a lot of what I'm growing here comes from stories that are not my own, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of them do. And I think that's really important to, to be able to tell your story. Um, and so I'm working with, for example, um, some urban food sovereignty projects like Nuestras Raices and mm -hmm. Polio. I'm very familiar with them. Say it again? I'm very familiar with them. Yeah, they're growing a couple Puerto Rican crops for, yeah. for the seed catalog, Gondules and Aji Dulce peppers. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm working with a bunch of local groups here, mm -hmm. like Viet Lead, okay. which focuses on Vietnamese um, varieties. Okay. The elders run their project in Camden. Nice. Um, they also have youth. Okay. So they're growing a bitter melon, for example, mm -hmm. for the catalog. Um, and, you know, various refugee groups, including them, and um, folks from Burma. Mm -hmm. um, and a farmer friend of mine in California who has a rural farm. She lives in Oakland, but commutes to her rural farm where she's growing a Korean melon. Oh, she's nice. Korean. From the town she grew up in. Okay. Um, that's also a site of resistance. Um, the U.S. military base mm. um, is is trying to expand establish its area. Their, yeah. their area and the, the the main industry there is melon farming, mm -hmm. um, and it's mainly women farmers. And so she's growing this melon from that town as a way both to share this delicious yeah. cantaloupe. It's not really a cantaloupe, right? Area, the striped yellow and white. Yep, yep. Um, Korean melon, but also tell that story mm -hmm. and support the resistance to that military base. Yeah. Um, and so that's, so as I've thought about, okay, what, why am I doing this? What am I trying to do? Um, I thought, okay, I want to support projects like hers. Yeah. Um, that's already doing amazing work in the community. Right. And shed a light on that work. And also right. bring in an income opportunity through seed sales. Um, but I'm also hoping just for general support as people read about these projects. Right. They find out more and see right. how they can support. Right. That's also, that's a huge reason why I'm doing this project too. That's, mm -hmm. the idea is to, you know, illuminate what people are doing, to show people what people are doing mm -hmm. and help draw attention to that so that people can get whatever kind of support that they might need, you know, whether it's right. just moral support or right. whether it's totally financial that. support. Yeah, everyone needs the moral <laughs> support. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the financial support and the, you know, just continued conversations about these kinds of mm -hmm. ideas, so. Mm -hmm. My um, partner runs a farm with an African diaspora garden attached nice. to it. Nice. And um, he's growing a bunch of beans from the Mississippi Delta mm -hmm. area where he grew up. Yeah. But also crops of the African diaspora. Right. Things that have become important in the new wor world. Right. Um, and, uh, and then I'm also, as I keep alluding to, growing, like a t this is an Italian black eyed pea. Um, which is called Fagiolina del Tresimeno. I hope I'm saying it right. You know, part of me growing these things is showing me how much I still need to learn about my <laughs> ancestral culture. But this is a beautiful little black, you can see it's swarming with wasps because they're after the nectar that still right. pumps out after the flower leaves. But it's this little beautiful bean, tiny black eye pea. Oh, wow. Um, and it's endangered. It's from Umbria. Um, you can see it's covered in pods, but they ripen just a few at a time, which makes it really hard for mechanical right. <laughs> agriculture. Yep. And, and hard for me. Right, <laughs> it's safe. Regardless, yep. Every day. Um, but it's a delicious bean, and it's really important to that area, and so slow food. Right. Um, well, and that is, you know, the birthplace of slow food, right? right. So. And this is really literally slow food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> forever um, but I've been growing it for a few years and um, slow food identified it as an important crop to that nice. area. So they're doing agritourism okay um, and working with restaurants and universities and um, around that area to try to support farmers growing yeah. this bean this nice. is black eyed pea um, so and I'm also growing a, an Italian eggplant and Italian butternut squash and some Irish cabbage and potatoes and um, working with a lot of rural farmers with your various European ancestries and asking them the same questions I'm asking everybody else, like what's yeah. your cultural food? Right. Um, I think it's important for everyone to bring something to the table. Absolutely. Um, so it's been a challenge for some people. 
and some people who haven't completely assimilated uh -huh. into this kind of mythical white culture right. have, have <laughs> been able to access their ancestral foods from their grandparents right. um, and grow those seeds. <clears throat> so it's been a cool exercise. All of the farmers I'm working with, this is their first year saving seeds. Oh wow, a, that's awesome. In a large scale way. Yeah. Um, so when's is, the catalog coming out? Um, as soon as possible. Okay. I'm hoping November at the latest. Okay. Um, it means, you know... It's tough putting together a catalog and farming at the same it time. It really is. <laughs> it means germination testing all the right. varieties, which means getting them from all the growers. Right. Um, and myself. Um, yeah, that's a huge project. Yep. And then, um, you know, designing the catalog and the website. Yeah. Etc. cetera. Yeah. Building a store, you know, stuff like that. Printing seed packets and packing them. Right. There's a lot that's going to happen in the next two months. Yeah, it's a lot of work. So, <laughs> hopefully November, if not sooner. That's fantastic. Yeah. So, um, this project, you know, part of it is about earth-based practices. And one of the things that I'm hoping to do with this project is to create a sort of new definition or maybe a definition for what does earth-based mean. Mm. So when you hear that term, what comes to mind for you? Well, I mean, first I think of other... I mean, and especially in terms of how it relates to what you do personally. Right. I mean, well, I follow various agroecological practices, mm -hmm. I follow various natural farming Right. Practices. And, and what yeah. types of practice, when you say that, how, do, how would you define that? Or Well, for example, I, for most of this field, I went no-till this year. Okay. Where I didn't use the rototiller. Mm -hmm. even. There's areas that were grass last year okay. that I did till, um, but the, the, the areas where I had grown already, I, there was no need to till. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, you know, did this all by solarization. Okay. So I would kind of chop the residue down to the soil level with a weed whacker or a hoe and then cover it with plastic you know it's not super earth friendly right. but it that's helped okay me, helped there's, me to there's not, always a balance right? right I mean we drove our cars here there's like a, there's contradictions um, so there I put down plastic clear plastic for a few mm -hmm. days in 70 plus degree weather and um, that just zapped yeah. the surface level which means I didn't have to clear away the the crop residue or weeds, right. but incorpor incorporated it into the soil. And then I put down a layer of compost mm -hmm. and maybe some mulch on top of that and plant right into it. And so that means that the soil structure doesn't get completely destroyed, which means airflow can continue, um, uh, water flow can continue, all the microbes and macroorganisms don't get destroyed in that process. Right. Um, and so for me, that also means I don't um, bring all the weed seeds up to the mm -hmm. surface, which are just like waiting, sleeping in the soil. Right. Um, when, whenever you, you know, till up the soil, you're exposing these dormant weed seeds, and so the weed pressure in here has been much lower. I mean, it looks really packed in here, and I might reconsider next year how yeah. close I plant things, but the upside has been not a lot of weed pressure. Right. Because um, I'm not exposing the weed seeds by doing no-till, right? but I'm also planting so that things fill in. Um, maybe I'll hoe once, mm -hmm. if that, um, and then right around this time of year I'm going through and doing like the first hand weeding, right. which is amazing compared that's to huge. previous yeah. years. Um, so for me, that's natural farming, that's earth-based farming, like literally okay. I'm not disturbing the earth. Right, you're letting it its own cycles do what they do. Letting it breathe, letting it the ecosystem stay intact. Yep. Um, and so that's been wonderful. I learned that from Tobacco Road Farm in Connecticut. Okay. From. Nice. A couple okay. Seasons and they've gone no-till. They're using a Korean natural farming method. Okay. Called indigenous microorganisms. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where you culture up the forest microbes um, in rice. Okay. And then in barley and molasses. And okay. then introduce them into the field and they're forest microbes are more fungally dominant. Right. Um, and a lot of times that's really beneficial to the field. Yeah. Um, which is more bacterially dominant. Um, so I'm working my way up. I, every year I'm like, okay, this is the year I put the box of rice in the forest. Right. And it's just like, I didn't get to it. Um, I also planted for all spring and early summer by the moon. Mm -hmm. So 
I guess that's moon-based farming. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the moon impacts the earth. Um, and so kind of following the cycles, following the various moon calendars, um, okay. try to be in, in touch with the kind of phases of the moon and how that impacts water and growth. Yeah. Um, and, and so that was wonderful. Um, once May, mid-May hit and I was out here just rushing to get everything in, kind of my systems I had put in place kind of went out the window. Mm -hmm. So I stopped following the moon calendar, but you know, it's just a practice that I'm hoping to build over the years. Right. Um, so, yeah, and I don't use any chemicals. Um, uh, I try to do integrated pest management. Mm -hmm. This area is out of control. This was squash, corn, and more squash. And then there's amaranth. Yeah, I see the I had four rows of squash, and I planted the amaranth right down the middle of each. Uh-huh. Because the squash, uh, the cucumber beetles prefer amaranth. Okay. And so even literally as I placed the plant in the row to bury it, the, the cucumber beetles were jumping onto it. Right. And so to me, that was a way to distract. Um, and it worked. That's fantastic. Yeah, they immediately left the, the plants alone. That's wonderful. I'm still, I'm still learning because then later we got the squash bugs and it right. took a major toll. Um, but I try to kind of work with nature instead of against it. Right. So. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, we had, on our brief phone conversation, you mentioned that you feel like um, this is a spiritual practice for you, or there's something spiritual about it. Can you expand on that? Oh, sure. Um, it's not something I've talked about much, but, you know, I've taken cues from a lot of other farmers yeah. who um, really bring their spirituality into their practice, including my partner. Okay. Um, and, you know, for me, it's really great to, to come out here alone in the morning, you know, and be with the land. Um, and kind of take inspiration and kind of help, the land helps me like also focus on my own intuition. Yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, I actually spent the morning here this morning trying to kind of thinking through the symbolism of this land hmm. as I think about how to kind of portray my project yeah. this morning and I was suddenly surrounded by like hummingbirds. Ah, oh, they were like that's amazing. And, you know, it was it was beautiful. I mean, they, they drank, were coming to tell you. There's a lot of flowers that they drink here, from the runner bean to the canna lilies to the zinnias to the dahlias. Yeah. Um. And um, yeah, it was it was really beautiful. And then the goldfinches drink the or eat the sunflower okay. seeds. But anyway, spirituality. Um. Yeah, I've always had kind of a private spiritual practice with the land since I was a kid had, with my own huge garden but also growing up in the forest yeah I would spend hours and hours with it um, and which part of Connecticut are you from I'm northeastern Connecticut okay so Will romantic Willimantic yeah I grew up right outside yeah. of town um, and uh, so for me that's that's just an important part of my well-being is being kind of recharged and inspired by the natural world, yeah. which is really everywhere. You can't escape the natural world right. in the city. Right. And it's so nice to be in a space like this, and like yeah. surrounded by, by forest and um, and seeing the health of this land. So, you know, one thing that I try to do is thank the land. Um, you know, respect the space that I'm in. Another practice I've adapt, adopted um, from my partner is, you know, his father is also a farmer and he okay. um, puts the seeds that he's planting in his mouth first yeah. before he plants them as a way to kind of acclimate them to your yeah. needs, you know, and to, who, to you, so right. that they're producing for, right. for you. Um, I love that. Which I found a beautiful practice and, and I just started really noticing that each seed felt different. Not, yeah. I don't mean the texture, I mean like right. the energy. Of, yes. And I can almost tell when it's, it's um has a lot of vitality in it mm. still. Um, just by the somehow the feeling. Um, so yeah, I have a lot of practices like that. Okay. I mean, similar, there's a creek here. 
Okay. I meant to tell you to bring your bathing suit. <laughs> <laughs> but I spend a lot of time in the creek, especially in the hottest days. Yeah. And part of that feels extremely spiritual. Absolutely. So, um, like that's the water that's percolated through this land. You know, it's also feeding back. Right. Um, into this land. Um, and so to be kind of immersed, literally immersed in kind of the water of this land is yeah. really powerful. Um, it's inspired me. I'm also a musician, and since it's a creek in particular, it's really inspired some of my most recent songs. Just okay. It's such a powerful yeah. spiritual experience to be yeah. in. Yeah. What kind of music do you perform? It's um, acoustic. Du- I'm in an acoustic duo. Oh, nice. Um, we've been together r- almost a decade. Wow, that's fantastic. Album. Awesome. Um, so it's a big big part of my life, but it's always secondary to farming. So it's nice that sometimes they combine to kind of take an inspiration from the land yeah. you know, into the music. And usually when we tour, we visit lots of other farms. That's okay. Like, that's who my right. people are. Right, right. <laughs> so. Is uh, there, do you have um, like a touring schedule online or um, how can one find? with it, we actually just finished all of our dates that we had for the summer. Okay, nice. Yeah, I'm sure we'll make some more for the fall. Okay. Yep. Very cool. Yeah, we're called uh, My Gay Banjo. Nice. Mm-hmm. That's a great name. And this most recent album has just become very political as the times we're living in. Mm-hmm. Um, which, which is great. We've been trying to combine our, our work, our activism and organizing mm-hmm. to our art for a while. Right. So. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, so can you talk about your winter job, which is teaching classes and the types of classes that you're teaching? Sure. Um, so in the winter, I usually teach, well, for the last six or seven years, I've taught um, something called the training of trainers for farm school in New York City, um, which comes out of a training that was led by Just Food, where I previously worked, um, and originally came from Heifer International. And it focuses on how we lead workshops in a participatory way, hands-on way, that is based in the lived experience of the people who are in the classroom. Um, it's a novel concept. <laughs> yes. Instead of a top-down, lecture-heavy mm-hmm. um, technique, which we all are familiar with um, for the most part, if we were, went through traditional schooling in this country, yep. it's offering techniques that actually pull from the learners you know, their questions, their lived experience, and also what they hope to do and what they plan to do when they leave the classroom. So going from where they started and where they will be at the end. Um, and so it sounds like a, you know, a cool concept, but a lot of people don't know how to implement it. And so this class is kind of both focused on some of the mechanics of it and then lots of practice with it. Nice. Um, so after they've been through the course, we have them kind of do it for the rest of the participants. 